Good morning to everyone. So hi, I'm Mark. So I'm going to start my talk off by asking three simple questions. These are not trick questions. I ask for the first two that you applaud for a positive response. On the third question, I'm going to ask for a show of hands. Question number one, who in the audience has realized their purpose in life? Question number two, who in this room feels that they have something valuable to offer? <laughs> Question number three, while you were trying to live your purpose and bring your value, who in this room has felt discouraged? So I'll tell you my personal story. I have known my purpose since I was 12. At 12 years old, I decided that I wanted to be an engineer, that I wanted to use math and science to change the world. But I will tell you since the age of 12 to becoming vice president of a major utility, I was discouraged. Sometimes that discouragement came in the feeling of self-doubt. When I gave an idea and no one listened, only for that idea to be accepted when it was given by someone else. Sometimes that discouragement felt like isolation when I would go to technical meetings and I would be the only person that looked like me. Sometimes it was just downright anger when people would dismiss me because I was African American or because I went to a HBCU. I'm gonna tell you, that one really pisses me off. <laughs> so I can relate to the people in the room where you know your value, you know your purpose, and you just wanna contribute, but you're discouraged. My big idea for today, it's pretty simple. The opportunity cost is too high not to show up for women who want to be more. I want to share my big idea through the stories of two women. Two women that never met. Two women whose only connection is the gentleman standing up here on this stage. One of these women made me the man who I am the other woman created the profession in which I work. I wouldn't be on this stage today if it weren't for those two women. They created the passion that I have to make sure that women are included, accepted, and given a fair opportunity. My hope is that the stories that I share will support this big idea that I have that the opportunity cost is too high to not show up for women who want to be more. So I want you to do me a favor. For just a few seconds, I'd ask that you close your eyes. The first woman I want to introduce through sound. Open your eyes. Some of you probably know that sound, and many of you do not. Like, what in the world is that? <laughs> that is the sound of an IBM Selectric typewriter. <laughs> and I'll tell you just in a few moments why that sound is especially special to me. So the first woman I want to introduce you to is my mother. Her name is Gwendolyn Nell Regina Berry. She was born in Charleston, South Carolina in 1938 to poor parents. My grandmother was a seamstress. My grandfather was a self-taught carpenter. My mother valued education, but her parents couldn't afford to send her to school. My mom took it upon herself to go to a white male banker in the 50s 
and ask for $300 so she could go to school. This banker gave her that $300. She went to Allen University, which is located in Columbia, South Carolina. She majored in Secretary of Science and she graduated. She met my dad, Dr. Simpson Berry Jr. They got married. She moved to Birmingham, Alabama. She got a job working as a secretary at an engineering firm where she brought value to her company. But my mom spent her years supporting my father. My father was an educator. He got his bachelor's, two masters, and a doctorate degree. And my mom, in addition to making sure that we were fed every day, me and my brother, making sure that our needs were taken care of, she, in the middle of the night, would type those papers. So as a young man, that sound that you heard was the sound that I heard going to sleep. Because my mom, not only did she work all day, she worked at night to make my dad successful. But I want to tell you the moment that changed my life. And it happened at dinner. My mom would come home, she would cook, we would sit down, and she would talk. To my, parent, to my father, they would just have regular conversation. And I will never forget this day that my mom came in and she said, hey, there's this job at work that I want to pursue. I'm college educated, I work hard, and she gave her bona fides. And I'm sitting there and I'm proud of my mom as a nine-year-old young man because I knew mom is gonna knock it out the park, she's gonna get this job. Later, a week later, she came in, and I would never forget the disappointment and the emotion that I felt when she found out that she didn't get that job. But here's the kicker. Not only did she not get the job, they told her, you should be satisfied with what you already have. Now, my mom continued to work at this place for 32 years. She became executive secretary to the CFO. She had a good career. And I tell her story not for you to sympathize with her. But think about my big idea. The opportunity cost is too high not to show up for women. So who paid the cost of what they did to my mom? That company paid the cost, and society paid that cost. So my brother and I, I'm an engineer, my brother's a lawyer, we kid all the time that my mom is the smartest person in the family. My dad was a superintendent of schools. I'm a vice president at a major utility, and my brother has his own firm. But we all know that she's the smartest. But no one showed up for her. So let's think about opportunity costs. What is that? Opportunity costs is something that you pay for an alternate decision. Next question to you as a Next question to you. Please clap if you think you have talent. So if I can make opportunity costs real in this room, 50 years ago, all the talent in this room was not available. Not because the talent was not there, but because we lived in a society at that point that was not receptive of women giving their talents to the workplace. So yes, it's a personal story for me, but it's also a professional story. As a business person, I want my group to be the best that it can be, which means I need the best talent. That doesn't mean I need the best male talent or the best female talent, but I need the best talent. As a country, we are 300 million strong. Does it make any common sense for 150 million people not to have the opportunity to do and to give their value to us as a society? The second story I like to tell is one about Rachel Carson. I don't know if you know her, but Rachel was born in the early 1900s. She was born on a farm, 65 acres, and she became passionate about the environment. She went to school, she got a bachelor's degree, 
in biology, a master's in zoology, but she had to go to work to support her family. She had this talent of being able to take technical information and writing it in such a way that it would connect to people. Rachel, in the 60s, wrote a book that fundamentally changed the world. The name of that book is Silent Spring, and it talks about pesticide use and how it affects both the environment and people. And she asked a simple question. She said, yes, I know the value of this pesticide, that it prevents typhoid and malaria, but have we considered the impact to birds, fish, and people? It was a fundamental question. Well, how was it received? People received it, but industry did not. They fought her. They called her a communist. They called her an hysterical woman. She didn't have the degree or the credentials or the knowledge to question what we were doing as a society. She testified before Congress. She went before America, and she gave this story, and she connected in a way that has fundamentally changed our society. So the question I have for you, what if she decided not to write that book, if she decided not to move forward? Can we think about the opportunity costs that would have cost us as a society? So what does all of this mean? There was a poem written by Robert Frost in 1916 called The Road Not Taken. And the last two sentences are pretty simple. It says, I came upon a road in a wood. I took the road less traveled by, and it has made all the difference. As a society, the road that we have been traveling is one of exclusion and inequality. We can't do that any longer. I implore the people in this room, you know your passion, you know your value. Do not allow discouragement to push you to that other road. There is another Rachel Carson in this room, and society needs you. We need you to make that choice. But that's not enough. We need men like me like a nine-year-old boy so many years ago who decided if I ever had the opportunity to support someone in the pursuit of their dream that I would do it. We need men to make a different choice, to go by the road less traveled by. So I ask that you close your eyes once again and listen to this. That's a sound that we don't hear in the workplace anymore. For I want you to remember that sound as the sound of inequality. That as a people, as a country, as a culture, we need to do something different. We need to take the road less traveled by called equality.